Good evening. Good evening. I was all set to uh, start, and it seems like there's a secret message up here. There's, um, they knew that I was going to introduce Mark, and one of the faculty members got a parking ticket. This stuff always falls in my lap, I suppose. So, too bad. Hey, that's what I, hey, my prerogative, you know. <laughs> Robert Mangurian. <laughs> I'll take care of it, Bob. The um, 1989 uh, fall lecture series um, begins this evening. The, uh, it's a fairly long um, series um, as they go, but it's actually quite an extraordinary one. Uh, the fall lecture series is the efforts of the, uh, the, um, the graduate uh, students that have just completed uh, the first year and are going in, and are now in second year, um, as tradition has it. And the, the spring lecture series is done by the undergraduate uh, students. Um, it's a collective effort. The, the five people that I know were involved um, very directly were Barbara Bester, Maggie Ross, Chris Lawson, Sarah McDonald, and David Offer. Um, there was, I'm sure, others that helped um, on it, but it was, it's, it's quite an effort. And uh, I know having done it once myself some years ago, it's, uh, it's like producing rock concerts, trying to get everybody here and scheduled. Um, the series over the next um, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, 10 weeks uh, include people from around the world um, the theme is architecture and representation. Uh, this evening, I'll, I'll introduce in a moment, um, um, is Mark Angelio. Next week is a Japanese architect named Shin Takamatsu, who's uh, doing you know, some uh, quite extraordinary work uh, in, uh, in uh, primarily in Japan. Um, after that is a uh, um, an author and film, film theorist named Peter Woland on October 4th. Um, on October 18th is um, a woman that's um, currently among the uh, most important graphic designers uh, in the world, April Griman. And then the subsequent week, the following week, is Elizabeth Diller, an architect uh, from New York. Uh, who is coming in also for the entire week to uh, provide a workshop uh, for the students here. After that is an architect uh, from Pennsylvania named Adele Santos. And then um, a recent arrival who I, I refer to those types as transplants uh, is Dagmar Richter, um, a German architect is taught on the East Coast and is currently teaching at UCLA. Um, will be lecturing on November 8th. And then one of our adjunct faculty will be uh, lecturing the week after that. Um, I think one of the important architects of our generation, uh, Billy Chin. And then a visiting, another visiting faculty um, whose uh, office uh, is in Atlanta, Georgia. She's teaching here this semester. Meryl Elam will be on November 29th. And then an architectural theorist uh, from the East, um, a fellow named Michael Hayes, wrapping it up, hopefully putting it all in perspective for us. So it's, uh, I think, going to be quite uh, uh, an exceptional uh, semester. The uh, work, if any of you saw the work, my prior, the lights going out on the walls, is um, um, the work of the, of the current first year graduate students the work that they produced prior to coming here. Um, I saw it for the first time today, and 
I think the, the one thing that's it, it's, it's, uh, at once exciting and at, at the same time makes me a bit nervous um, um, is that we seem to be attracting uh, each year um, a more exceptional group of students. Um, what makes me nervous is that now we have to provide an education that's up to the standard that they're used to. So it's, uh, I think, uh, uh, quite, uh, um, quite a statement of where we've come over the last 18 years that we now have students that present work um, that they've done prior to coming here that looks like work that used to be produced after they'd been here for three years. So I congratulate you for uh, making the correct choice in coming to Sire. Um, Mark Angelil, um, also a transplant, um, part of a breed of young architects, I think, that are very interested in, in uh, building of buildings, um, but also looking at the combination, uh, the symbiotic relationship between theory and practice. I think um, those of this generation that are um, eventually end up and will end up in Los Angeles. Uh, Mark is currently an associate professor uh, at University of Southern California. He's taught at uh, the Graduate School of Design in, at Harvard, and uh, he did his, his schooling uh, where he received um, a Doctor of Technical Sciences and a Master Degree in Architecture from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, or the ETH in Zurich, as it's uh, known. Um, where he also taught for a while. Uh, his academic research focuses on theories of architectural technology. Now, what's, I think, important about um, the research that Mark has been doing is that he looks at um, architectural technology as an aesthetic issue, as opposed to merely um, um, technology being instrumental to maintaining the body temperature at 98 degrees and, and keeping architects from defying gravity, which I think is uh, perhaps in the European tradition, um, but it's not certainly in the American tradition, which has always looked at technological issues in a more uh, pragmatic way. So I think that the, the, the fact that he's here in Los Angeles at a time when Los Angeles is starting to uh, form itself um, in many ways, the architectural culture especially. It's, uh, he'll, I think, play an instrumental role in that development. As uh, he's written, is that the research addresses the relationship between theory and practice in the production of architecture. The investigation of technology is founded on the assumption that theory and practice are inherently connected. Since architecture as an expression of human culture depends on the context of technical matters, architecture assumes a position in which thought and action converge. Both form and technique are to be considered constituting factors of architectural creation. Ultimately, form and technique physically expose a relation between theory and practice. I think uh, um, in talking with Mark um, it, over, the, over the last couple of years, um, uh, Dean Robert Harris has um, um, allowed us to borrow him from time to time to teach uh, uh, classes here, and I think um, in listening to what he's had to say, seeing the results of uh, of, uh, of 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 his teaching, um, which has been really quite inspirational and invigorating to the students, and talking with him personally, I think that the both the research and the work that he's doing is uh, uh, quite important to us all. And with that, I give you uh, Mark Angelio. Thank you for the introduction. I'm, I'm very touched. It is a great honor for me to present some of my thoughts and work here at SIARC. What I would like to attempt this evening is to present an ongoing experimental project done in collaborations, uh, in collaboration with students, first at Harvard University then further expanded at the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence and uh, continued at uh, the University of Southern California here in Los Angeles. The project began several years ago 
when I was given the opportunity to teach here in the United States and involved more than uh, 100 students over a period of different successive academic terms. The project, in this regard, the work of a collective, has not reached any definite state of completion, but is uh, to be considered a continuous effort with the intention to explore or research the role of the design process in the production of architecture. This intention became quite clear to us at the very beginning. We realized within the first weeks that a certain disagreement existed between my European educational background and a generally accepted common mode of operation exhibited by my American students. I was primarily talking about working methods design strategies, process structures, while the students approach architecture in view of the final solution, in view of the formal manifestation of the architectural product that was to be created. I was indeed quite surprised when perspectives on yellow tracing paper and facade compositions emerged on the desks within the first week. So we agreed to start over and to combine certain characteristics of our respective approaches. We decided to focus on an investigation that would address the relation between process and object, between the possibilities of working methods in the design process on the one hand and the resultant, the resulting product in its formal appearance on the other. We began, I have to say, with a certain naivete to engage in this enterprise and also with a great amount of enthusiasm which probably carried us through difficult periods. If you could focus the slides, please. The suggestion was made to begin with an analysis of the site, a common mode of operation, apparently, here in the United States. It starts with analysis of the site, of which you see here a representation in model form, the city of Sabionetta in the Po Valley in northern Italy, built according to the Renaissance vision of the Città Ideale, or ideal city. That was our first project. I agreed to the suggestion to start with an analysis, but only under one condition, that every step of the analysis be done not in isolation, but through architectural production. Furthermore, in order to emphasize the interconnection between the process and the designed object, I asked the participants not to use tracing paper, but instead to consider every drawing as a hard line, final drawing, presented on white opaque paper in ink and pencil. This would allow us to document the process, as well as to focus our experiments towards the production of uh, possible solutions, which had to be created directly on the desk. This method had a significant impact on the architecture that was being created. Through analysis, or in other words, through the reading of an existing condition, architecture was being defined. We then tried to apply the same method to whatever we had designed, continuously analyzing what had been created, and since analysis involved production, the architectural solution was constantly redetermined. This method suggested the application of recursive procedures and thus a certain open-endedness to the process. But most importantly, it allowed the readers of specific texts to become their authors, 
for every analysis was done through production, encouraging the writing of architectural texts. A few examples before I go on. Those were our first attempts. In this case here that you see in the slides, the analysis led to a juxtaposition between the ideal Renaissance plan and the manifestation of that plan in reality. The building was to serve a center for the political opposition. Thus, the place selected for the site was to be the space between the ideal and real wall of the city. Geometry and internal structures of the building, such as the definition of the circulation zone, for example, followed established orders that were determined by the interpretation of the existing contexts. At another location, the wall of the city had been destroyed during the 19th century. This intervention by the bourgeoisie was to accommodate with the grand alley of trees a new entry into the city. This physical rupturing of the wall evolved as the theme of the project. It was decoded by the placement of a bar building breaking into the city, as well as by means of relocating the missing piece of the wall shifted in plan and realigned according to the geometry of the 19th century intervention. The created space was covered and internally organized to become a supermarket outside the walls of the old city. Some projects remained within the realm of the abstract, like this one here, representing an attempt to find interpretations of architectural forms according to the structure of the city grid and its transformation into three dimensions, while integrating at a conceptual level possible understandings of functional requirements, in this case here, a factory building. Other authors attempted to address the realm of the concrete. This project carried a similar strategy for understanding contextual structures into an analysis of the program a hotel in this example. The author invented architectonic manipulations according to his reading of programmatic requirements. Those were first decoded in a series of diagrams and then translated into space-defining elements. He then transformed these elements in view of uh, his understanding of construction principles, allowing him to address the domain of tectonic considerations. After this first phase of our experiments, we realized that we are stuck. We lacked a theoretical framework for understanding what we were doing, for the work seemed coincidental, and the process marked by a series of incidents that had been discovered by chance. We decided to engage in an analysis of texts that address questions pertaining to the notion of process in order to at least partially understand how design production had been historically perceived. This meant an exposure to the history of ideas, an exposure of our work to theory. This was insofar a difficult task is that it involved certain risks. For such an approach might suggest the possibility of finding a manifestation of a theoretical proposition into practical work. The difficulty lies in our awareness that line-for-line -line correspondences between theory and practice cannot directly be traced. With a certain freshness, we nevertheless engaged in such an enterprise and as Nietzsche said, we accepted to live to a certain degree dangerously. As we wanted to focus on how processes of making have been understood within our culture, we believed it to be appropriate to begin with a study of descriptions of such processes. We began to search for early texts addressing the activity of making. While interested in tracing the origins of this concept, 
we came upon representations, and since representation is the theme of this lecture series, it might be quite appropriate. But I'm going to soon refute that concept. We came upon representations of uh, the first maker and descriptions of the first act of creation according to the Old Testament, one of the significant historical documents for understanding the roots of Western culture. The Bible begins with the genesis of the world, the description of what could be considered a process of production, and the foundation of the argument that the world is created by design. This concept asserts God as the maker of the world, as is clearly depicted in those two French 13th century Bible illustrations, showing God with a compass, tracing the limits of the universe. He is considered the architect or chief maker derived from architecton of the world. I very much hope that this reference to God is not misunderstood. We did not by any means imply any equality between the architect's work and divine creation. On the contrary, our intention here was to trace historically determined understandings about concepts of making and specifically how artificial creation, meaning work done by man rather, uh, rather than natural or divine creation, was viewed and perceived. Quote, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, exemplified by the shapeless mass in the middle of the circle. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and God called the firmament heaven. End of quote. The wavy blue shape representing the waters which were above the firmament. The following two observations were deduced from this text. First, God is depicted as an artificer in the act of making, in the process of constructing the world. The Bible begins with the description of a process. He uses an instrument as a technical device to achieve his goal. This concept is clearly stated in Proverbs 8.27, in which it says, when God prepared the heavens, when he set a compass upon the face of the depth. As those illustrations were made during the Middle Ages, they furthermore refer to the compass as a tool of the building trade. The compass used by God to delineate the world, to give form to matter, was an instrument commonly used by master masons to transfer measurements from drawings to actual full-scale size. Our first observation, in other words, identified that natural creation was seen in analogy to the activity of man as a builder while referring to practice and the techniques and instruments of building construction. The second observation we made is that the act of divine creation involves language. The text of the Old Testament repeatedly quotes God, phrasing certain ideas that are connected with the physical making of the world. And I quote, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, followed then by the use of language to name the firmament heaven. A connection is here established between thought speech and the process of physical translation, so to say the writing of the text. In the New Testament, this relationship is further specified by, suggestion, by suggesting that prior to action, prior to the use of the compass, there is the formation of thought. This concept, in which thought directs action, is emphasized in the Gospel of John, summarized in the phrase, in the beginning was the word, Creation is not to be considered a mere application of material and practical activity, but is qualified by the considered use of language as a bearer of meaning. From these two observations, we deduced that Genesis, which can be translated as the coming into being of something, encompasses a twofold definition of creation. The first pertains to physical construction 
to making, to practice, or to the Greek term techne. The second involves thought, the formulation of ideas, the creation of theoretical constructs as defined by the term logos. For our understanding of processes, this suggested that techne and logos were to be seen in conjunction with one another, establishing possible modes of relationship between thought and action within making. We then discovered that this relationship between technical execution on the one hand and conceptual thought at the other was at the center of another passage of Genesis. I'm referring to the first description of a construction and building process in the Bible, the erection of a piece of architecture made out of brick and mortar. I'm referring to the Genesis, the coming into being of the Tower of Babel. Again, language plays a significant role in this allegorical passage, the story of mankind attempting to reach the sky and to challenge through the, the building of a structure the power of divine creation. The construction of the tower is directed by this very single idea, symbolized by the imposition of a single tongue. The manifestation of this a priori, a priori thought and the translation into building of one exclusive language, however, did not succeed. What could be read is in this text is that the destruction, the destruction of the tower by means of a multitude of languages exposed the concept of making to the very possibility of criticism. It has been suggested that the incompletion of the tower constitutes the very structure of the tower. The architectural metaphor of an incomplete tower reveals the acceptance of critical thought and of questioning as inherent components within the interconnection between thinking and making. This could offer for the mediation between idea and building, A, the acceptance of an always present possibility of technical failure, and B, the identification of a weakness pertaining to the problematic power of single truths, arguments, or ideas. This interconnection between practical activity and language, between techne and logos, which is at the core of those two passages of Genesis, was also found in our search in the writings of Greek philosophers. For Plato, the word techne not only pertained to particular activities, but also addressed knowledge. In the Gorgias, for example, Socrates argues that every techne is involved with logoi, words, speech, bearing upon the specific subject matter of the arts. Plato, however, did not join the two terms, techne and logos, to form one expression. It was Aristotle who probably used the word technologia for the first time in his writing on rhetoric. Aristotle's use of the term addresses the role of thought about the technique of using words in speech. We found here a connection between theory and practice. Aristotle understands the technology of rhetoric as the logos about the techne of speech. In this sense, technology is understood as the science addressing the techniques of a particular art. Yet the meaning of the words did not directly correspond to contemporary understandings of the term technology as the field pertaining to technical development but offered a more expanded definition of the term technology as the thinking about making, suggesting furthermore the status of art production as discourse. We continued our search and came upon this illustration by Jean-Jacques Lequeux entitled drawing instruments for the architect. The writing of architecture, the writing of architecture as is depicted here, 
involves the creation of the drawing by means of specific technical tools in order to mediate between the idea and the building. This concept of design as the strategy for writing architecture, as we discovered through our readings, has been attributed to the establishment of architecture status as a discipline during the Renaissance in the writing of texts on architectural theory. The subject matter of the theory was to be the practice of architecture. The task of the architect, according to Alberti, for example, pertained not to action per se, but instead to the idea of making as an intellectual construction. Alberti writes that the architect is not a carpenter or a joiner, nor a manual operator, and that he did not engage in activities through physical labor, but instead through his intellectual capacity to recreate in abstractum the concepts inherent within manual work. Alberti divided the discipline of architecture into two main sections, designing and building. The former, i.e. design, was conceived by thought and imagination. The latter, i.e. building, by matter and work. Design was to be the arrangement of lines and angles conceived in the mind, and those are Alberti's words, lines and angles conceived in the mind, defining what was to be built with great precision. Building construction, on the other hand, was considered the totality of procedures and materials accounted for within the processes of physical realization. Here two illustrations from the Leone edition of Alberti's treatise, both identifying possible translations of thought into the physical reality of building. The one on the left, the transposition of lines and angles on site for determining the placement of foundation work. The one on the right, the application of theoretical scientific principles for the development of cranes to be used in the construction of building. In order to design according to the possibilities inherent within the craftsman's work, the architect had to ha have knowledge, according to Alberti, of all practical aspects of the building art, in addition to the knowledge of the theoretical sciences. This conceptual union of practice and theory, of art and science, of techne and logos, is at the core of Alberti's vision. The design in drawing form that was to represent the idea as well as the physical building was considered the vehicle for achieving the synthesis between practical and theoretical knowledge. The construction of the drawing, furthermore, was seen by Alberti in analogy to linguistic constructions. In his treatise on representation, De la Pittura, he proposed that the structure of language could be considered a model of didactical significance. He writes, and I'm paraphrasing to a certain degree, quote, I should like young people who first come to the arts, meaning painting, sculpture, and architecture, to do as those that are taught to write. We teach the letter by first separating all the forms of the letters, which the ancients called elements. Then we teach the syllables. Next, we teach how to put together all the words. Our pupils, in painting, sculpture, and architecture, ought to follow this rule." End of quote. Such a differentiation between elements and the rules according to which those elements were to be put together seemed to us quite familiar. We were intrigued that the concepts of morphology and syntax in modern linguistics were here at the center of an architectural vision during the Renaissance. Where is the degree to which such an analogy between language and architecture holds true was questioned on our part. We nevertheless were interested in the description of an analytical approach to architecture that suggested the system of language as a model of reference. 
Of interest specifically to me here was that the making of architecture, i.e. the design, could be seen as a construction, a process of writing, a process that could be called, to use a French term, an écriture architecturale. In juxtaposition, we seemed less interested in an architecture parlante. That is, we were less interested in the proposition that architecture could be seen as a kind of language. This is a concept supported by a number of authors in our field advocating the establishment of formal vocabularies considered as linguistic formulae of canonical significance. Such an approach has been uh, initially attributed to Sebastiano Serlio, who was the first to present the five orders as the primary components of architecture's formal system and the basis of an architectural grammar becoming a universal language. Being critical of this formal model that has been considered the foundation of the classical language of architecture, we tried to identify what we believed to be the problematic aspects of its use, of its application. Serlio, as is well known, opens the discussion on the orders in his fourth book, showing the five orders placed in linear sequence, each an independent entity, yet together forming a complete set. He presents them as components of a catalog, part of a textbook to be selected by the architects for their very specific use. Similarly, other architectonic components are introduced, as you see on the right, such uh, as a series of different wall coverings presented as motifs of uh, stylistic expression. The different orders were each elevated on a pedestal, their authority thereby emphasized. This gesture of uh, dramatic intention was supported by the accompanying text in which the orders were introduced as characters are presented in a play. Architecture, we believed, was here on stage with a purpose to create, create a certain ambiance. Architecture becomes the stage set of the city as Serlio depicted in a series of woodcuts offering through the careful composition of a vocabulary of forms the expression of different moods. Our criticism was certainly not directed towards Serlio, for we believed his contribution itself the result of creative thought and a powerful construction of the mind. Our criticism is directed toward a design method that identifies, enti identifies entire vocabularies of architectural forms defined as the arrangement of parts placed according to specific rules. With a sense of irony, this approach has been depicted by the draftsman Lequeux, as Tony Wiedler points out in his recent book, The Writing of the Walls, in the Rendezvous de Bellevue, a mechanical assemblage of fragments composed of already formed images, a strategy commonly used in contemporary architecture. Widler writes that this is Gluckeux's draftsman revenge on architects, absorbing their profession into his, thereby completely undermining all of its codes. Widler, furthermore, makes a reference to an essay by Roland Barthes on the portraits by the painter Achimboldo that you see here in the slides. In his analysis of those paintings, that are composed out of vegetables, shells, flowers, Bart identifies the method involved in such pic picture language, the technique of breaking down and reassembling forms of iconographic value. The paintings are, according to Bart, dictionaries, not of words, but of images. The connection here could too easily be established to a common method of architectural design that we strongly opposed. And with that I mean the dominance of pictorial image-oriented figuration in the act of making, the use of historical vocabularies, 
of commercial icons, of machine imagery, or of dead tech. In other words, the predominant preoccupation in architecture with surface appearances. Such approaches propagate an understanding of design as the representation of the final object, as it will be perceived. This is the self-conscious effort to make architecture speak, thus the term architecture parlante. A text by Ferdinand de Saussure further clarified our position. In his course in general linguistics, he introduced at the beginning of this century, in his now well-known reference to the chess game, the differentiation between external and internal features of languages. He writes, and I quote, if I use ivory chessmen instead of wooden ones, the change has no effect on the system. But if I decrease or increase the number of chessmen, this change has a profound effect on the grammar of the game. One must always distinguish between what is internal and what is external. Everything that changes the system in any way is internal. End of quote. And it is in this sense, I believe, that architects have for too long been preoccupied with external appearances and with surface structures. Architecture needs, I believe, to be attacked from within by constantly reassessing its internal systems and deep structures. Our traditional methods only mimic the products. Instead, I advocate an understanding of design as a constructive method, as a process of writing that reassesses the inherent complex complexities to be addressed by our field. An écriture architecturale, the writing of architectural text, suggests that every document produced is essentially a presentation of certain solutions to specific problems, rather than the representation of a final object's appearance. Every drawing, every model, is a working document, a construction document to a certain degree aiming at the construction of knowledge. I'm talking of the architectural project, uh, project as an art that addresses its genesis, the way in which it becomes. Thus every drawing or document is a demonstration of construction, not a prescription, but a manifestation of both techne and logos. With techne pertaining to the means of architectural production, including understandings of specific drawing techniques, such as sections or dissections of the work, as Daniele Barbaro said, to demonstrate all the interior parts of works, as well as including the inherent possibilities of physical construction, that is, understandings of material properties, of the inherent possibilities of tools, and the methods pertaining to building procedures. And at the other extreme, logos, aiming at the domain of abstraction, and thought, the realm of invisible ideas and of intellectual constructions. This also includes the logos of techne, i.e. the knowledge about techniques, as well as the techne of logos, i.e. the structures of thought in view of the history of ideas, the science of interpretation, and most importantly, the development of critical reading methods that constantly put the work into question. We continued over the years to identify writings that attempted to address architecture from within rather than in terms of surface appearances. For a while, we believed to find a valuable proposition in an approach initially attributed to Andrea Palladio that should suggested prototypical solutions to specific architectonic problems, such as the description of stair types as components of a building's vertical circulation system, presented as a topological sequence. This strategy, which identified elements and rules of how to combine architectural components, was later considered by Jean-Nicolas Louis Durand, the foundation of design. In his uh, 
treatise, Précis des leçons, treatise uh, which was uh, his course of architecture. This method was called the mechanism of compositions that allowed to combine the simple elements which are for architecture, quote, like words in language into complex structures, end of quote. Those models, although of significance for the history of architecture, seemed, however, as uh, they were founded on a prescription of rules to limit our investigation into the structure of design processes. A series of treatises on architecture offered an interesting alternative that was less preoccupied with the manifestation of a final product. Philibert de Lorme's main, main works, for example, published at approximately the same time than Palladio's Quattro Libri, revealed a different emphasis in addressing the practice of architecture. Instead of describing possible formal prototypical solutions, Philibert de Lorme offered methods of geometric projection, explanations of assembly processes, as well as lists of tools and instruments of which the architect had to have knowledge. Another treatise by André Philibien in the 17th century took this approach a step further by exhibiting a higher degree of precision in describing instruments of construction, techniques of the various trades, as well as the place of production where manufacturing processes occurred. This was entirely new for the discipline of architecture. Of significant here is, this, uh, is that Philippien's effort was guided by the conviction of offering an alternative theoretical foundation to architecture. The theory was not to be founded on formal propositions pertaining to the architectural object, but on the processes of its making. It seemed that an inherently different philosophical posture was here advocated, which one can find quite clearly articulated in the writings of Francis Bacon, also published during the 17th century. He was interested in understanding objects of the material world in terms of their condition of existence. Quote, things as they really are, considered not from the viewpoint of appearance, but from that of existence, including thus the processes that led to an object's condition of being. The connection to uh, Denis Diderot and uh, Jean d'Alembert's Encyclopédie of the 18th century seemed quite obvious, for several references to Francis Bacon were made in the preface of the work. A general overview was here given in the Encyclopédie of the productive forces within society, describing methods of work and manufacturing processes. But most importantly, the Encyclopédie revealed an interest in identifying the internal working of things, as we see here uh, in, a, in representations of a windmill and the design of a greenhouse. Although critical of the Encyclopédie's confident and optimistic understanding of technological progress, we were interested in its attempt to propose a relation between theory and practice in which the former aspired to offer understandings of uh, the latter. And from here, the step to Jean-Baptiste Rondelet's treatise on architecture, published during the 19th century, seemed also a logical one. Rondelet expressed that architecture was to be considered as the physical and material realization of the theoretical sciences of which the architect had to have knowledge. In the slides, two plates showing precise geometric operations for describing the surfaces of specific objects. The interest in construction and in engineering was at the core of his uh, theoretical vision. For example, he was interested in properties of materials to be researched through load testing devices in order to identify material strengths. Rondelet not only emphasized the necessity to provide a theoretical foundation, 
but he also indicated that the creation of form in architecture was to be in accordance with uh, the technical means of construction. Architecture could only evolve as an art form, according to Rondelet, when practical and theoretical knowledge, i.e. techne and logos, were conjoined. Our research seems to direct us towards the study of art production at one extreme and understandings of science at the other. In terms of art, which was understood in its uh, traditional sense as pertaining to the practice of production or techne, the work was to be guided by techniques of making. Art was not regarded as stylistic, nor was it romanticized as belonging e exclusively to the fine arts. On the contrary, art comprised the processes that brought things into being. This concept was uh, identified during the cent this century by the art critic Clement Greenberg during the 1930s as a strategy that allowed art production to evolve out of its own techniques. He argued for a medium mystic approach in which art would reflect its own existence. The work of Jackson Pollock, for example, gave emphasis to the processes that led to the creation of the artworks. A true avant-garde imitates the processes of art, Greenberg writes, while kitsch merely imitates art's effects. Similarly, in the work of Javashev Christo, every step of the process, including administrative as well as manufacturing procedures, are considered as pertaining to art, including also the processes of physical construction on site, as well as the final piece. Art was viewed in terms of practice. At the other extreme, the investigation directed our research towards science, understood in its traditional sense as theory, thus pertaining to logos. Modern science endeavor to formulate hypotheses about the functional internal working of things was at the core of our investigation. Gottfried Semper's preoccupation during the 19th century, for example, with snowflakes and astronomical patterns, revealed his interest in deep structures as pertaining to scientific thought from which architectural principles could be understood. Similarly, Siegfried Gideon attempts to grasp the concept of time as uh, the fourth dimension of space, revealed his interest in abstract scientific propositions and their potential influence on art and architecture. In the slides, two illustrations from Mechanization Text Commands, depicting graphic representations of muscle movements in frog legs when exposed to electric shocks. Recording, however, and that is probably more important, recording movement in, t in time. Four-dimensional space in physics was attempted to be translated in two and three-dimensional forms through photography and wire models that you see here in the slides. Again, two illustrations from a mechanization text command by Gideon exhibiting probably the difficulty in representing an inherently abstract concept, such as four-dimensional space, into intelligible forms. But what about five, six, or n-dimensional spaces? In the slides, Lawrence's uh, strange attractor on the right, on the left, and Poincaré's section on the right experiments that began to address spaces beyond four dimensions, suggesting concepts removed 
from our direct experience. This is taking us back to Francis Bacon, who was one of the early propagators of scientific thought, to Francis Bacon's proposition that phenomena need not necessarily be considered in terms of their appearance. He questioned the evidence of the senses. as he became interested in the possibilities of abstract thought. What I'm trying to say is that an essential component of scientific thinking, or logos, incorporates abstract concepts that are removed from immediate observation. Concepts such as Galileo's notion of infinity or his understanding of frictionless planes were not visible but instead intellectual constructions removed from sense perception. Material objects were understood in view of various established schemes of abstraction. When Galileo and Newton set up their concepts of inertia, or when Einstein introduced the concept of relative time, they had not passively reproduced facts as taken from nature. They had instead created artificial concepts which they then applied to explain natural occurrences. Scientific propositions, in this sense, are inherently abstract, constructs of the mind, and therefore of the imagination, founded on man's ability to imagine the invisible. Scientific thought, which we believed at the beginning to be so inherently rational, has always included imagination, incorporating intuition and creativity. Imagination, whether in science or in other fields, has always been essential for establishing bridges between the domains of conceptual thought and intelligible physical constructions between techne and logos, in other words. But let me return to our work. We could have uh, been easily overwhelmed by all these thoughts and the multiplicity of theoretical propositions to which we had exposed ourselves. We had to continuously intellectually regroup. But most importantly, we were able to survive, as my students here in the audience know, by maintaining production. We saw as a key component of our process the possibility of researching in the work the grounds on which a fruitful interaction could occur between conceptual and imaginative thought. That relation, however, could not by any means be obscured, but had to be physically defined, archi architecturally manifested in drawing and model form. Let me show you the work. In order to operate on such grounds, one cannot blindly accept the status quo. One must constantly challenge the order of things and preconceived notions about architecture. This is, I believe, one of the tasks of the university and of institutes like this one here. Experimentation was therefore at the core of the project and considered the modus operandi of the process. Theodore Adorno writes in Aesthetic Theory, and I quote, in a situation where there is no secure basis in terms of form and content, creative artists are compelled by force of circumstance to experiment. Experimentation is painful, he writes. It elicits resentment against so-called isms or groups of artists consciously united by a shared agenda or style. End of quote. The studio, or atelier, I believe is the place in which ideas are conceived and brought into form. It is a place where hypotheses are tested, rejected, and newly formulated. In this sense, the architectural product that is being created 
must be seen in close affinity to the process of design. The design studio, as the locus for exploring architecture, offers us a framework for understanding the relationship between the means and ends of architectural undertakings. A primary objective, in other words, pertains to the investigation of the processes which contributes to the formulation of architecture. Design, as a method of production, consequently engages in a search towards the definition of new solutions. In analogy to the concept of laboratory experiments in the physical sciences, the architectural design process in the context of the studio environment must encompass the idea of experimentation. Design work, considered from such a vantage point, suggests the possibilities for searching and revealing in a very general sense. Experimentation ultimately constitutes the only possible mode of operation in the process of design. Investigations of process imply an awareness of the specific techniques involved in production. Technical design skills must be considered in view of ideas, concepts, and intellectual constructs in order to achieve a meaningful architecture. Only within such a framework in which theoretical and practical considerations are merged can an investigation within the nature of process be identified. Adorno writes, construction necessitates solutions that are not immediately present or obvious to the senses. Within construction, he continues, the unforeseen then not only is a contingent effect, but also has a moment of objectivity." End of quote. In that idea, a connection is established between experimentation as an operational strategy and design as a constructive method. The experiment presented here developed sequentially within a defined structure to the process of design, moving gradually from the abstract into the concrete, whereby attempting understandings of what Roland Barthes called concrete abstraction, meaning the possibility of a work to be both concrete and abstract at the same time. The first step suggested a syntactic analysis of a given work of architecture. The analysis was to be performed through the creation of an architectural artifact. While reading the text of the given piece, a new text was to be made by the designer, which assumed both the roles of reader and author simultaneously. Emphasis was put on a syntactical understanding of architectural constructs, syntax being the structure of relationship between architectonic elements. The question of meaning in architecture in other words, was to be addressed through structural ordering, suggesting ideas or conceptions inherent within the architectural object. The second step involved questions of context as pertaining to time and place. Modernity, as manifested in urban structures, was considered to contribute to the simultaneous existence of multiple systems of order reflecting a heterogeneous quality in which conflict and contradiction have become accepted norms. Urban contexts were to be read and architecturally redefined through analysis and design production. Based on understandings of urban structures, characterized not exclusively by order, but including divergence, rupture, discontinuity, and fragmentation, a new context was to be created while integrating the conceptual framework of step one into the new syntactic text of the site. The third operative step focused on the inherent aspects of use, purpose or function. Programmatic requirements were to be understood in terms of their essential structure and meaning, i.e. in view of ideas, as well as in view of pragmatic considerations. 
as defined through systems of functional relationships, architectural space was to be created by means of the precise placement of architectonic elements. Transformational methods were to be invented in order to address the fundamen fundamental meaning of the aspect of function or use in the production of architectural artifacts. These operations were furthermore brought to synthesis with the formations of the previous steps. The fourth step required the integration of tectonic considerations into the design process. Propositions belonging to the material reality of the architectural object were to be made so as to inform the project's internal condition. The field of building construction offered aspects pertaining to material qualities, methods of construction and production processes, involving understandings of structural systems, envelope, circulation system, and mechanical equipment, leading gradually to the precise development of details. Meaning in architecture was here to be addressed through the possibilities of physical ordering, suggesting a material manifestation of ideas as they pertained to the architectural project. The design process, consequently, allows the reading of physical form to be informed by the object's internal conditions. Let me summarize. The work involved an exploration of the interdependence between design process and design product. Procedures, techniques, and methods of making architecture were investigated in relation to the architectural object. Emphasis was put on the awareness of the instruments involved in the process of design. The pencil and ink drawing and the model were to be used as precise tools and contrasted with the framework of ideas, attempting a synthesis between material project and intellectual constructs in making architecture. The drawing and the model were not to be seen as representing a pictorial image of reality, but instead were to be understood as integral to the procedures of the project. This involved an attempt to find correspondences between the inherent qualities within the techniques and the structural order of the architectural object. Therefore, in attempting to avoid the dominance of pictorial image-oriented figuration, the project encouraged the discovery of structural orders in their visible manifestation. The problems that I would like to identify, I think, are rooted in our preoccupation with complexities, which led to the creation of complex if not to say complicated formal expressions. I believe that future explorations should aim towards the strategic reduction of architectural means. Jean-Paul Sartre's expression, écriture blanche, white writing, and Roland Barthes' term, degré zéro de l'écriture, zero degree of writing, might suggest a more subtle approach. Sartre and Bart point towards an instrumental function of language in which simple and reductive means allow for multiple and open-ended interpretations. I hope that the work in this case, in this sense, will allow multiple readings, suggesting an un understanding of architecture as an open text in which the reader or the user, to a certain degree, will become its constructor. Also, I believe, that we have been too much preoccupied with extraordinariness. Instead, I think it is time for us to address the realm of the ordinary. It is probably time to replace screaming by what has been called parlare piano in architecture. I hope we'll be able to maintain or to attain those objectives without losing previous potentials of the work. The criticism that architecture has for too long focused on the presentation of pristine objects 
and their representation in drawing form still stands. A critical understanding of our field still necessitates a reevaluation of the roles of processes involved in the production of building. And I would like to still maintain that rather than emphasizing surface appearances, an architecture rooted in process might ultimately aim at revealing the fundamental and deep structures inherent within the making of architecture. One of the primary tasks of the process, I think, is to provoke intuition and ingenuity. And the awareness that both intuition and ingenuity are founded on knowledge, and that knowledge must be applied with greatest imagination. Thank you very much for your attention. any questions or comments, observations? Yes. Do you, do you want to come to the mic? No. Yes, I, I, I think I understand your, your observation. Yes, it, it is a problem, yes, without doubt. Yes, if we leave the term logos aside for a, for a second, uh, I, I, I nevertheless believe that an architecture parlant is uh, outside of our realm of, of, of work. That when, when the work is done, when it is being used by users that will try to read it, they will read whatever they want to read into it. It is, it is not in our uh, realm of competence uh, to direct their reading. Do you, do, you, do you know what I mean? No, I'm not communicating a, a kind of Okay. Correct. What, what about techne? No <laughs> so let's focus on techne. <laughs>
yeah. It, it is cons constantly into, into play. The, the, moment, the moment you start reading the first line that you have put on paper, you will automatically engage in an analysis of your work, and I hope a critical analysis, which will then define the continuation of, of the work. I, I, I don't see that, w I don't believe that one stops and then criticizes in one's work. Yeah, on, I think the, the criticism must occur on the grounds on which the project has been established. Uh, within, within the established frameworks of, of the author's enterprise and not, not from outside. That, that requires, for me then, as a, as a collaborator in the work, uh, participation in the work. I have to be part of it then. I, I can't step away. <laughs> to criticize the work on grounds of the work. If there are no other questions, well, uh, thank you very much. I very much appreciate it to be here tonight. Thank you.